Good evening and welcome. I'm Sarah Angel and I'm honored to be here with Sherry Boyle, Rajni Pereira, two of Canada's greatest artists. We are at Patel Brown, um, where Sherry and Rajni occasionally show their work. They're two uh, self-repped artists, lady bosses, and we're going to have a great time talking to them this evening. And Sherry and Rajni, the first thing I want to ask you is how did you come to know each other professionally? Like, what was the first work that each of you saw of the other that kind of made you stand back and go, wow, this is a person who I'd want to work with? Rajni? You want me to go first? Mm, okay. First. So seeing Sherry's work was, for me, actually like a turning point of my whole career. So I was in art school. This is like a bit of a story. I was in art, I was at OCAD, you know, being sort of crushed under like the heavily colonized curriculum of OCAD at the time. It's getting better now, which is great. Um, and what year is it? This is like 2000, because I did six years in school. This is like 2005, I think, 2004. So going through the motions, hating the group of seven, all this crap. And I was like, I don't care about the great masters. Do they have nothing to do with me and what I want for the arts and culture of this city, or what I at least want to see as a mirror. So, you know, going to, and it's funny, going to the AGO had always been prohibitively costed for me and my family, because I come from a poor immigrant family. And then we never really went, you know, the last time I'd been there when I was like in grade nine doing some volunteer thing. So I decide one day, I save some money and I was like, I'm gonna go to the AGO. So I stroll into the AGO and there's all the Renaissance, like there's all that great master stuff all over the place, oil paintings of white people, oil paintings of white people. And then I get to this room and they, had, I think, just made that acquisition a mm. little bit before I'd gone in. Mm. But two of Sherry's works mm. were in, it's the room with like all the oil paintings, like Canadian landscape stuff, and it gets a little funkier in that room yeah, too. You're talking about rejection of Pluto and yeah, ceramic works. Yeah, in sitting in that room, and I was just like, "Holy shit!" Like I can do because by that time I was like heavily trying to incorporate science fiction and surrealism as an immigrant experience into my work, not seeing any way to do it looking around, looking at only being able to find sort of like science fiction in, as a subgenre or f surrealism and fantasy as a subgenre and not seeing how it could belong in the fine art world. And then seeing her work there, like just speaking so eloquently on like an experience and so beautifully made and like just the clear, the clarity of the narrative. I was just like, oh my God, like I saw, so seeing her work, seeing her work in the AGO, kind of like opened a window for me completely as a fine artist. In fact, I would say that if I didn't see her work there, I might not be here today at all. Wow, yes, yeah. that so, is pretty, thank it's a God. big thing. <laughs> and, yeah, and, thank God, I well, no, there, no, no. I missed it and turned. <laughs> uh, fantastic that the AGO did that so-called intervention of your work within that the yeah. more classical type Yeah, that space. was for the 2008 redesign, and that was piece, uh, ironically, was called To Colonize the Moon. Ooh. Yeah. That is, that's really nice. I know that Cherry also is um, you're an amazing female mentor, and that, that's always been something that's really important to you. So, so I know you probably... Uh, uh, that, that Rajni's work for sure would have stood out for you, but... Absolutely, and making the connections and the lineage in Toronto in this place. We both have Scarborough connections from history, but also um, just the kind of richness that's so rarely brought to our attention that's kind of we have to find ourselves. So for me, it meant so much to have someone of a younger generation whose work I think is extraordinary. And as soon as I saw it, I felt like an immediate attraction and recognition because of our huge uh, mutual caring for the handmade and the intricate and the narrative sensibility of surrealism um, and kind of bringing our own idiosyncratic kind of worldviews into a image-based practice that's really lovingly made with uh, materials, you know, and like with huge respect for material traditions, craftspeople traditions, kind of folk traditions, things like that that are so evocative in her work and mean so much to me and mine, so immediately I saw kind of a sister there. 
Um, what was what was the first work you saw by Rajni that that was sort of that wow? It was the embellished photographs actually that I first saw. Ooh. I think because that was this really profound practice, not only of this incredible hand skill, like the detailed patterning and the textile kind of referencing going on over top of these photographs, but also the subject matter of these really regal, beautiful representations of people from her life, people that maybe, maybe have commissioned you as well, to kind of present them in this incredibly noble and, oh, like just fantastical, but really dignified and really powerful way. And it was so beautiful to see all these men and women of different ages, and and also I really love the kind of feminization, like a not, and I don't even know, like maybe a non-gendered kind of approach to the intricate uh, yeah. decorative over top of these really noble-looking, beautiful men, um, and that really was so touching to me. It was very moving because the men embodied that so gracefully, mm -hmm. and your color and patterning on them, and the dec like the details of the flourishing just kind of created this real like filigree of spirit for those people and it was really it's really really moving work and then that Thanks, work Jane. gets brought into all of the imaginative worlds that Rajani creates and also I think both of us as people that make figurative work often around the female body too we haven't seen tons of that out there like, yeah no. it, you know what I mean no. and so and so that that what that can create metaphorically and the way that we can tell our stories through that, it's not really, we're not really referencing a history of obviously like European painting. No, so I, when people see the figure, they automatically assume that in white Canada, that that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But there's other ways to have bodies. <laughs> Even as a white person, there's yeah. other ways to have bodies than yeah, European painting. So them. I feel like people can look at my work and say it's figurative, but I've always struggled with how to, how to name it uh, because I don't feel associated with that tradition. But both of your works do seem to me to be sort of almost working in an anti-modernist type of trend, anti-traditionally European modernist trend that is very much about um, an internal vision, craft, um, and, and a place that's hard to define. Is that, would you see that as accurate? Mm. I don't like the dichotomy of, of staying away from, from tradition or like staying away from, from something that we're presented with. Because I think for me, I work inside also these, those tropes. Like I work inside that too, right? Like let's use painted photography as an example. Like that was the way that I came across that work was at the ROM itself, curated by Deepali Diwan, like a museum held archive of these photographs that were you they were they used to be commonplace yeah. and it used to be like something that photographs. yeah that like that um aristocracy and royalty used to use reproductions of these to uphold their own power like they're the spectacle of this impossible power in mm -hmm. some cases like painting huge crowns and like crazy jewels that stuff doesn't exist mm -hmm. that gold doesn't exist you know it's just for the peasants to see it and be like feeling even scared so it's like, I really like to work like within what you say is like a tradition, like these traditional uh, methods or traditional um, sort of visual tropes. Working within that can also be really powerful um, subversion, really powerful fantasy inside something that's there already that, you know, in some cases it's run its course. Well, I want to, okay, so I should say we're, we're in Patel Brown Gallery, we're sitting in front of a work by that you've created, Rajni, a work that you've created, Sherry, and um, they have a really nice complementary quality to to one another. Can you each tell me a tiny bit about the pieces that are behind you? Um, that I feel like I've been like the rope as a metaphor is something that keeps coming up with me forever because it's just a great thing of being bound and tied and restrained but also struggling with something that's a you know can either hold you back or could perhaps be thrown out the window to escape with you know so i like that idea the body i'm really love fracturing it and making it into a shape that's a body but also it's not correct you know so there's these kind of three different points in the spine that are moving around and the beauty of the body and movement but also the head is very much just playing with um kind of a classic comic book uh, representation of a person that goes completely outside of the real and the combining a more like 
traditional approach to a representational body with a head that is so f almost just at the edge of not being human. And this is a ceramic Dialogue. piece. Is it? Yeah, it's porcelain. It's all porcelain. Yeah. And, and and that is a medium that you've worked in for now. Over Probably, a I said, yeah, almost like twenty years now. Uh, really, wow. since I started around two thousand one, two thousand two. So that's hand built, and I also like the fragility and the tension of that. That it's very rigid, and there's a brittleness to it. It's very strong, but it also is. You have to have love and delicacy to handle it, and so I really insist on that. In a way, like it's kind of like separates the the careful from the non-careful, and I want the world to be more of a careful place. And Raji, tell us about the piece that, that you're sitting in front of. Yeah, this is a piece um, from the Traveler series that I've been developing for. So the series is based around um, the future of immigrants and with an insistence that immigrants are the successors of the future of the planet Earth. Um, and, uh, and I deal with ideas of mutation. This is all like intensely within like a science fiction lens that I'm operating for this, but it incorporates so many different ways of saying science fiction, like uh, things like spaceware, things like um, armor and adornment and protection of your own spirituality, protection of just your body and your skin and like uh, an environment that, you know, that's suffering environmental collapse, which we are, you know, faced with in the present day. Um, and that results in like all sort of layers of different um, uh, artisanal traditional techniques of fabric making being the protection for the body as, as opposed to like the uh, Eurocentric or um, an American plastic, space plastics. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Spaceware has just looked like crap for so long. <laughs> Kubrick, was, this Kubrick was the last <laughs> guy to do cool space. Where did futurism come into your practice? Oh yeah, I mean, Everyone who deals with futurism, I think, in their work has the very has this very unique sort of contribution to futurism. I have a lot of friends who are strategic, they're foresight strategists, and they have this contribution to futurism that's like theoretical and data-based and like oracle-like. And then my contribution would actually be something that pulls from my ancestorship and goes forward as this way to sort of uh, talk about a, a victory of people who have never been been able to survive in their, their place or colonization has kicked them off or like their resources are now depleted and they have to cross a border. What does that mean? What do they meet with when they do that? So that's the future of immigrants that I talk about in this series. And then for this work, you can see that there is a travel, so a traveler is an example of a, of a successor of a, of a future immigrant um, who, and they, and I actually make a lot of the the garments that you'll see them wearing now. So I make the pollution wear and I'll start, I've started world building inside this world just to flesh it out to my satisfaction. And this is someone who's caught in a flood. So this piece is called Flood. Okay, so you, you discover one another. What's your first collaboration together? The first one? It's Weather Woman. It's Weather Woman. It was Weather Woman, so she... Tell, tell us about Weather Woman. Yeah, so she came up with this awesome project where she wanted to collaborate with three other women artists, and she does the busts and, and sculpts them completely and fires them and everything. I mm -hmm, think it was mm -hmm. like all bisked. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, go ahead. So, <laughs> so uh, I did the glazing and then, of course, acrylic painting on top of it after to get like exactly the colors I wanted, and I built a veil because um, ceramic cracks and you have to fix it. And then there were the option of like, oh, we'll just patch it up, you know, as per usual. And I was kind of like, I want to do something a little funky. So I made a veil that comes around the front with like all this sort of hand stitch, like frilling. And, and mm. there's like rooster feathers and mink fur as well, Ooh. black mink fur coming out of it. Kind of in the crack. And yeah, yeah, and then there's, it's, I painted my bust with um, a, her hair is like a swirling tornado. And then there are bees um, sort of all throughout, sort of like a, she becomes this landscape of, of insects that are agitated by, by crazy weather. And why was it important to you to do a collaboration and extend this invitation? Oh, well, you know what? I was really inspired um, by this. I just came out of 
exhibiting and co-curating and writing and thinking for years about this exhibition, Earthlings, which I created with the Esker Foundation, and it included my work. It was originally a solo show, and then I opened it up to try to share that platform for the work of the um, many different artists that are working with ceramic in Rankin Inlet because I think around colonization when I try to like reduce like think like boil it down to like what would what could we do to um, have an alternative strategy now historically to colonization especially as white person white Canadian I think that it really just comes down to sharing like Colonization is stealing and, and taking resources, but if there had been shared equal platforms, we would never be in this situation. So how do you kind of go back and try to share now, right? And so as an artist, it seems the most evident and simple gesture you can do is just share platform, share work, share credit, share money, share resources, share space. And then your subsequent collaboration to that? Mm. You did a painting. Yeah, we did. A yeah, painting we just wanted to fool around and see if we could work totally on the same paper. Yeah. Like just you know, and that was something too that I kind of like because it, it was so successful. Shuvani and I doing like I you know we would each do our own. We'd start in our own uh, studios and then start a piece of paper and then trade and finish each other's drawings. And I like that idea because you have kind of a sovereign image. You know, where you can, you're not really riffing back and forth all the time. You're kind of doing, you have your place and they have theirs. And so we tried that as a first experiment and it is incredibly strange. Yeah. A lot that you mentioned uh, working against a colonial mindset. And that's something that is so defining in both of your art practices. Can you talk about some work specifically and, and how they exemplify a, a, a desire to move away from a colonial mindset, to move away from a traditional academic approach to art making. Rashni? Yeah, I was, ha I was having trouble. Like, I feel like every, uh, everything that I've done since school has been just like pushing, pushing back against it so hard. Um, what was for you the aha moment where you, were, where you thought like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I can't do this. I'm not doing this yeah, kind of thing. It, that was, I'm... it was, yeah, it was realizing while I was in school that there's a lot of like, I mean, first of all, there are not a lot, ma too many students of color when I was there at OCAD. So, and whoever was there was like, you know, not being forced, but like really limited in really limiting themselves to a, to sort of a white settler or like a, a trending Caucasian method of, of arts making. So mm -hmm. say there was this period of time where like line drawings and like, and that sort of look became really popular. And I just saw, I just saw everybody sort of doing stuff like that. Every person of color was around me, student of color around me. Just like, just kind of being like, you know, what's going on here? And also, and then just realizing the limitations of the faculty itself, right? Who were directing these students. It's like, they were, all primarily white. I think that I had two faculty of color my entire stay at OCAD University. So it's just kind of like, and there was even like racist ways of like being talked to while I was in that school about my work, exoticizing my, exotifying my work. Uh, I had the word the Orient applied to my work at one point, <laughs> which I was just like, what? Did this just happen? This was crazy. So, so anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it started really, really early for me. And that it even, you know, that I had to push back against colonial ideas of like art making, uh, where it gets shown, the way that I talk about it, uh, and the way that I sell it too, and, and do the and, business and, as well. And in selling it, you employed online sales and, and, and tell us a bit about that. Holy, I mean, uh, <laughs> I hope Instagram's not listening. They're gonna wanna cut. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, you know, I had my own website and that went, you know, I started that in school. Like I just did it by myself. Like I went on, I think it, it, it starts with the W. I can't remember the name of that, that company now, but then I had a square space and I was like constantly updating that and like figuring out how to put sale platforms on there for my prints and multiples. I was making those by myself, buying photo paper from Vistec across town, bringing it back to the OCAD print department, doing print tests. So I figured out how to do beautiful multiples on low budgets. And that, that sort of thinking has like helped me a lot now in like budgeting on larger scale budgets and like just being effective. So it's just like... And just figuring out a different way. 
Figuring out always a different way, always a different, there's always another way, a better way to do it. And like new materials, testing and these things like that. It's the same attitude of having like coming from scarcity and not having privilege that actually helps me quite a bit now just getting things done. And Sherry, tell us a bit about your decision to push back against colonial I think traditions. It's interesting because as I listen to Rajani, I hear also some of our distinctions around generation and uh, background and cultural kind of affiliations. Like I, for instance, I've, I'm just probably old enough that I came, my, a lot of my ideas were formed before social media and the internet. So when I think back about my ethics or around uh, sales and selling and commercial art, like I actually had the notion going into art that this would be a non commercial life. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and the exact is, opposite yeah, of what I see. Opposite <laughs> of this thing. And it's not that I came from any kind of money because I'm from a working class family and I had no um, financial just wasn't possibility <laughs> from my family to help me at all. So I was always working all these side jobs to keep myself going. But I was never really aiming towards being a wealthy person. I was actually aiming towards being a non-materialist. And so, and, and because I came out of kind of more of a punk and do-it-yourself zine thing as a teenager and in the music realm um, it was more about selling out and not selling out it was a real kind of um, and that way. never crossed your mind I'm well it's a different it's a different kind of generational thing because also it, I mean there's a lot of analysis I think you can do critically about those ideas previous but I think a lot it was very white idea and it was like white kids pushing back against white families mm -hmm. and white kind of structures of capitalism that weren't serving them so there is like a, a generational kind of politic that happened out of the punk movement that if you were involved in that like really was questioning uh, kind of where you were heading and what you wanted to gain out of work and life, right? And so I applied those kind of ethics towards art and it's only years later that as I, you know, came in and out of success and did things as huge as the Venice Biennale and as small as like performing in church basements that I have realized the kind of impact of how deeply I'm in, in, embroiled in capitalism in the art world. Okay, so now though, now we are in the middle of a pandemic yes. and, and you are both very involved in making art, both involved in making large scale projects. Um, tell me a bit about those projects, Rajni, Sherry, and then, and then a bit about what it means to you to be making art during this time. Yeah, yeah, I'm really lucky. So counting my blessings in a huge way, um, but also dealing with the extreme trials and tribulations of producing and fabricating large scale work during a pandemic. And this is everything from like rising costs of materials due to like shipping shortages. This is, you know, some folks work ethic just literally disappearing into thin air from their circumstances. There, no, not necessarily. It can be like fabrication stuff. It can be like anybody that it's everyone so drastically can be so drastically affected by times like this. And you have to really instead of you really have to like zoom out your perspective and be humbled by the times. And I've been sort of, you know, learned to produce within that during this time. I'm opening the Traveler series at Tramway in Glasgow, which is a beautiful gallery, and I've been working with Claire Jackson, the curator there, who's been so, so incredible. Um, of course, there have been like many sort of shifts and changes with the timeline and the budget and the things and things of this exhibition, but finally this, everything left on the 9th, it got on a flight. Not on the 9th of October. <laughs> on the 9th of October, it all got on a flight on crates and it's in Scotland now. Um, so what I how many works? For, yeah, so it's the entirety almost, except for uh, whoever couldn't lend it or didn't want to, uh, the entirety of the painted series almost, and um, brand like the, all of the sculpture that you may have seen at the Patel Division space for from the solo show there called Traveler by the name of Traveler, and so all of that sculpture sculpted work. Uh, and a 10 foot tall statue, commemorative statue. A, a, a new, newly created. Europe. Newly created. Which just you for just tramway. finished. Just finished that. Never before shown. Mm -hmm. Never before shown. There's like little sneak peeks on my Instagram, but never really shown that. And that that thing was like, I don't know if we're, if would it I don't know if it would have been easier producing that in another time. It's just like that's a there are a lot of firsts for me in that that sort of scale of fabrication. 
um, and it's all new materials, like it appears to be a, a cut stone, but it's not, and it's foam, and it's a coating, and there's like a steel armature. So there's like many different moving body, like there's many parts involved in that, and coordination. In fact, I coordinated all of this, and then the crates being made at the same time, so it kind of like finished production and went in the crates. <laughs> right away. That's how <laughs> wild, <laughs> oh my God, I have Never PTSD. Stopped, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm really excited for the statue. It's called Commemoration Ancestor. And uh, it's a mutated fictional hero holding up like a light fixture and another basket object with full adornment by Nepsidu Paradise Fortif. Do you feel that your Traveler series that you began uh, years ago is now somehow coming to life during, during the pandemic? Um, it doesn't necessarily address issues of disease and pathogen movement throughout the planet and who gets affected and things like that. I can really see how it, how the issues that Traveler represents can, can definitely encompass those ideas for sure. But Traveler speaks more to, to displaced people, um, environmental collapse, what portions of society deal with that and how, and, and then I put that together with with um, science fiction, sort of dystopia, but with like a hopeful edge of resilience and survivorship at the end of it, placing uh, black, brown, and indigenous communities at the center of who, who, who makes it. And that includes off-world, that includes off-world as well. Though to me, it seems very prescient. Yeah, and I think, I think that's more of yes and to many. To many. And I think that the pollution wear and the masks definitely has, def has lent it, this sort of um, prescience now, for sure. But I wasn't thinking about any pandemics when I made it. It was a short time ago, too. No, and it was just like, as soon as it turned over, people were posting the masks and the masks. And I was just like, no, I was talking about colored folk not being able to breathe, but okay. <laughs> you know, like. Well, there is the same. I mean, if you just say that sentence, it could be related to COVID or. Yeah, it could be related to COVID impact, and yeah. it could be related to, yeah. to environmental collapse. And mind you, these are. Those two issues of displaced folk and environmental collapse and pandemics, they're two ends of the exact same blade. Like that's the exact same thing almost. Like pathogens traveling at this pace and who gets affected, it's the same as who can't breathe the air in a certain city and who can get away to a, or create a paradise for themselves and the privileged around them. And who can't breathe because of, of, of oppression. Yeah, I think, I think that, that art that you are both making is um, addressing issues that have been simmering for a long, long time right. and that are really coming to the fore, holding a mirror up to the world. People can interpret them as they may, oh, yeah. but, that, but that there was this, this something simmering, brewing all along. And Sherry, tell us about the large scale projects that you're doing. Well, I think that what you're saying, it rings a bell for me in that I feel like what you're saying in terms of how the work resonates in that I realized the work I was making that I've been making already for a year, which was a commission from the Gardner Museum in Toronto for a major solo exhibition that opens in February, 2021, and will tour for the next few years after that. There was nothing in that work that didn't and feel absolutely right for that for the moment we're in right now. And tell us about that work. Um, the work is around some like subjects that I've been thinking about my whole life, kind of what I've already spoke about today, um, but about how we see ourselves, how we see each other, how we operate in relationship, and how we kind of perform our identities in terms of how we've been socialized and how we choose to kind of present to the world. Um, and I'm looking at that through kind of a theater lens in a way. Um, and I'm really influenced and love the idea of the stage. I love the idea of uh, kind of amusement parks or places where we go to look at our own self 
through kind of a surrealistic distortion and see maybe human truths that we're not comfortable uh, with in a day-to-day -day kind of buttoned up way. So I'm using those uh, metaphors through the wax museum, through the amusement park, through the kind of chorus line and um, through you know the individual star under the spotlight at the end of the stage. The, you know, there will be a stage, there will be puppets, there will be animatronics, there will be giant uh, sculptures and small intimate uh, pieces with shadows and it's all new work it's all been made over the last two and a half years and I'm kind of homing into the big production and all addressing issues of identity kind of yeah identity and the perf like the kind of performance of identity the and the fluidity the, the fluidity of identity Sherry tell me what have you learned from Rajni, what is the one thing that you treasure that you take away from her practice? One thing I really love is watching Rajni speak her mind in public to pretty much anybody that uh, might. In I feel like one uh, thing around my culture that I've grown up in is a sense of like a certain kind of etiquette and a fear for um, offending or saying something that might be impolite or in, inappropriate in some way. And I'm not saying that like Rajan is a very graceful speaker and always is eloquent, but I've watched her say very, speak truth to power right in like one-on-one -on -one in a situation that made me feel like I wanted to kind of jump up and high five her and like bring that away to myself and say, hey, why, why do you feel afraid to do that? Rajni? Um, but it's like feeling the way that Sherry maintains her connection to community and looking at the way that she cares for her community. Where her studio is, right beneath it is um, Inspiration Studio, which is this like beautiful ceramic workshop that, um, that facilitates ceramic making by um, women who are living on the margins in different capacities. They come in and they make these beautiful works and they sell it. And she's been like God, running and gunning for them for like years and years. Just things like that, the way that she's in touch with the people who like matter to her, the people whose practices matter to her and that she cares about, the way she's in touch and checks in and some real mom energy. Mm. Like people talk about big dick energy. Like that's like, <laughs> this is the real, that's this well, the is really what it is. You know, she's what she watches she watches out for who's around and it's just beautiful and it taught me to do more of that because that work is the work that's actually the work when we when we started this conversation you mentioned like why doesn't toronto you know the toronto's pitfalls and caring about itself and it's just like it's sherry's attitude we need to have that attitude everyone's got to have that attitude like watch out for who's around you and then we'll be okay but you can't go on operating in a, in a vacuum and hoping that the culture around you grows. That's not the way it yeah, works. You've got Constant, to seed that. It just doesn't work. Like you've got to seed that. Constant transformation. And, and, and so to my last question, you're, you are two artists. You're at the height of your powers. You're, you're making art during the pandemic. Where do you see museums and traditional art showing going? Well, I mean, it's got to go in some way. You, I think we all know the way it's got to go, but yeah, things really need to change. And it's not just the pandemic, it's the BLM movement, um, really importantly, that has brought into focus mm -hmm. what it is that institutions need to be doing right now. Um, I, what I would like, I mean, the way I see it going, I don't know if that matters. What The way it needs to be going is, is uh, white folk really needing to take their hands off of ideas of power and the seat of power, that is not conducive to good culture building. Mm -hmm. And Sherry is a white settler artist. Well, it's interesting, can we still work in the same museum and academic systems with the kind of top-down power structure and be equitable? No, because sharing should have been done at the beginning on an equal wide platform. And sharing is not only about money, but it's about ideas and about cultural kind of uh, ways of thinking and knowing. So we have to all, as individual humans, watch out for our tendency to want to dominate. You know, and so this is something we all have to come back to together and like talk as equals. How do we, how do we make the right steps so that we don't recreate these endless problems? Mm -hmm. That's just uh, conversation and questions.
Well, I thank you both for this amazing conversation, all these thought-provoking questions. Thank you, Sarah. And, Sarah. And, and we are now going to take questions from the audience. So thank you again. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.